Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Rick Eisted. I'm a member of the Rotary Club of Calgary Fish Creek here in Calgary, and I will be your Zoom host for this evening. I'd really like to thank and welcome everyone for attending tonight's webinar. Uh, we had 55 people register for it, which is uh, a little bit above average. And uh, so far I, I count 29 or 30 uh, participants. So that's good and hopefully more will join us. Uh, we usually always have a few uh, last minute joiners. Um, tonight's webinar is uh, titled, entitled, How to Grow Rotary in a shrinking environment. Our presenter this evening is Jeff Foss, who is a member of the Rotary Club of Okotoks. I will more formally introduce Jeff by referring to his bio that uh, he sent me earlier. Uh, tonight's webinar is scheduled for one hour and is being recorded. Live transcription has been activated. So if you want to view it on your own device, push the live transcript in bracket CC button. Everyone's audio and video has been turned off except for our panelists. Please use the chat button to communicate with each other and the Q&A button to, to ask your questions. We will monitor both throughout the evening, but we will address everyone's questions at the end of the session. Jeff Foss has been a proud Rotarian since 2006, beginning with the Rotary Club of Red Deer and is a multiple Paul Harris Fellow, eight plus. In 2012, he transferred to the Rotary Club of Okotoks, where he served as president in 2014 and 15 and did such a great job, they invited him back and he was once again president in 2001-22. In his club, Jeff has also served as Director of International Service, Director of Club Service, and the Club Rotary Foundation Chair. He has led and participated in numerous fundraising events over the years, most recently a Canadian flag subscription program, which I also participated in and I thought it was a great program. Jeff has also participated in many community service projects over the years as well as an international um, water project in Sri Lanka. He currently serves as district membership chair for district 5360. And certainly membership is our number one internal priority. Jeff is married to Janice, his wife of 39 years. They have two adult children, James who lives in Black Falls and Ashley who lives in Calgary. Jeff, welcome and please share your message with our audience. Thank you. Thanks, Rick, appreciate that. And I also mentioned that uh, I've asked our past district governor and assistant area coordinator uh, in zone 28, Dan Doherty to join us. So uh, welcome, Dan. Okay, so let's get going. So uh, we know that membership is the number one internal priority for Rotary, uh, while service is our number one external priority. But in order to do the external one, we need some of the internal ones. So we need more helping hands to do more projects and more work and have a greater impact. So that's what today's all about. If you came for the beer, I'm sorry. Okay. Here we go. So we've seen this, these things in the news um, that service clubs are in decline. Uh, we see, I'm going to minimize this little screen here so I can read my own. Uh, service clubs uh, shrink as members age, uh, COVID continues, Lions, Kiwanis, and Rotary clubs are struggling to recruit new younger members, and uh, service clubs are the backbones of uh, our small towns, and, uh, and yet, I'm just moving my screen around here, sorry, uh, yet they need help uh, to, uh, to do what they were designed to do. And so that's sort of a negative view. And that's sort of the, the state of the union of service clubs in general around the world. Uh, we do know that um, our Rotary organization internationally is sort of holding its own at, at about the one point. It was 1.2, but with the addition of Rotaractors, 1.4 million members around the world. But the problem is, is that we're on a fairly steady decline in North America, whereas uh, locations like India 
are actually on the upswing. So that's what's keeping the broader numbers uh, uh, up there. So I'll go to our uh, own district here. And so what are our numbers look like? So from 2016 through to 2022, our district um, membership declined on average about 4.16%. And if you look at the trend line, it's not something that uh, is, uh, is, is what we want to see. And unless something changes, that trend line is fairly clear. And I've heard from clubs that uh, have told me that, uh, well, we had a tough year with COVID and or a couple of years with COVID, but we can see from this graph that it wasn't just COVID. In fact, it's, the trend line is uh, kind of running about the same as it did through COVID as it was before and after. Can everyone hear me okay? Just wanted to confirm. Uh, these webinars kind of don't give you any feedback. So thank you. Thanks for the thumbs up, guys. So let's take a look at what uh, this might look like if we were to continue down this path. So if we conservatively play out about a 4% reduction per year, and, um, and we're trending this from 2016 and moving forward uh, to 2033, um, we can see that if it carried on like this, that we would be uh, about half the numbers of what we started with in 2016. And um, once you get down to these kind of numbers, uh, it's very likely that our district, as we know it today, would cease to exist as a standalone district and would likely be merged with others. So I'm not saying this is where we're going, but if we don't change something, this is where we're heading as a district. Okay. So how are our clubs faring? Uh, nobody likes to know that they have an ugly baby. And uh, some of us, uh, uh, we've experienced this in our own clubs. And uh, so I'm going to share a little bit about how we're doing at the club level. <laughs> so when we look at, uh, there's a, a report that's called a membership growth index. And then hopefully uh, you've all seen it. If you haven't, uh, please ask your club presidents and membership chairs. Uh, they were sent uh, their uh, membership growth index uh, at the beginning of the year here. Um, so of, out of our district, seven clubs are in the green. So they have 80% uh, plus likelihood of continued growth. They're, they're continuing to grow and they're doing fine. So. Um, in fact, um, some of them, a lot of them grew through the, the uh, COVID lockdown. So um, we, we know that it's possible. Um, about eight of our clubs are in the yellow. So it's a fragile balance. They could go either way. And um, 31 clubs so, are in the red. And um, so unless something changes, there's an 80% plus likelihood of continued failure. And that may be shocking to some folks, but, uh, and I don't want people to feel badly about it. I just, you, you don't know what to fix if you don't know what the problem is. So let's, uh, let's take a deeper dive. So again, when I say there's clubs in the red, the yellow, the green, um, each club was uh, sent out um, a, a worksheet um, with the statistics uh, that you see on the screen. Uh, at the individual club level. And um, so we have two different things that we're measuring here. We're looking at attrition and we're looking at attraction. So people are leaving your club, people are coming into your clubs. And when the people that are leaving is a greater number than the people that are coming in, that's where you run into a negative growth index. When Obviously, people are joining your club at a rate greater than they're leaving. It also is, uh, shows that that's a growth club. Okay. So when we look at attrition, um, so what is attrition? Again, that's kind of the inverse of retention. Uh, so attrition, when we look at um, if it's 10% um, or less, that's kind of world-class for 
any kind of a membership organization uh, around the world. And um, so if your club is losing people at a rate of 10% or less, then attrition probably isn't your problem um, because that kind of covers the life happens things. Uh, people um, get transferred to another locale or uh, something in their life changes uh, or they pass on, sadly enough. Um, and uh, so we lose people because of that. So uh, if you're in that 10% or less, um, you probably don't need to focus on attrition. Um, and in the rotary world in North America, actually, the average is about 15.5%. Uh, so if you're kind of in the around that 15% mark, you're kind of in the rotary average. And um, but what's most important to know is uh, for at the club level, why people are leaving. So when you terminate somebody in Club Runner, there's some options to, to put in there to reasons why somebody left. And when I read through the data, um, it, it didn't explain uh, for a large group of people why they left. Uh, so the data is sort of like, uh, you know, the old saying, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, so if we don't put in there why people left, then at the aggregate level, well, it's hard to do the analysis. But uh, from a club level, you should know why people left your club. And so, for example, let's just say that they, they said that, uh, you know, I have some, uh, you know, personal reasons I left the club. And in my business, um, in the telecom industry, um, we always talked about the five whys. So ask why five times. So they say, well, I have personal reasons. Well, why or what, what, what's the, the reason? Well, I don't really want to say, well, you know, I, I can't solve the problem if I don't understand why you're, you're leaving. And try to get to, without being, you know, a pain, uh, but try to get to an honest answer of why somebody's actually leaving. Because we could be trying to solve a problem that, uh, I'm sorry, I just see that there's a couple of, uh, notes here. Yeah, it's difficult for people to be honest why they leave. And, you know, I think you have to leverage your relationship with people to kind of get to that point. But it's important because uh, to the degree that we can figure out why people are leaving will be to the degree that we can fix the problem. And I'm not saying it's going to be perfect, um, but I think we do need to make an attempt. Um, insufficient attraction is the other thing. And I think by and large, that's the area that most clubs um, are having difficulty is uh, they, they may be losing people say at the 10% level, but um, they're, they're maybe attracting people at the maybe 5% level. So each year they're still declining by 5%. And uh, so I think that's an area that uh, the club leadership needs to really focus on. And then, um, you know, in addition to uh, our attrition that we have to deal with, uh, we have to then find new additional members. So let's say that if, if I'm planning a, uh, a club that's going to say lose uh, three people because that's my 10% for my club of 30, um, so I know I need to replace three just to stay at the same level. And if I expect a, a growth of, uh, of another 3% or 10, another 10% rather, uh, then I got to find another three people. So really I'm looking for six people, three to make up for those that I expect to leave and three more uh, to, uh, to actually grow our club. And there's another chat. Yeah, there you go. And Dan suggested have someone from outside, like your AG, to do an exit in interview if uh, if you don't have that relationship with that person or it's un uncomfortable, for sure. Okay. Um, so you're, you'd say, well, wait a minute, our club is growing. Um, what I want you to be aware of, and you probably already are, is a phenomenon known as the June swoon. So as we get to 
June uh, when the invoices go out uh, for the July one billing, um, that's when we tend to clear out our house. And it's not just us in our, our district, it's every Rotary Club around the world. Uh, this phenomenon known as June swoon is there and it creates a seasonal aspect to um, what we do in Rotary in terms of maintaining our numbers. Um, so please do be aware uh, that uh, you, you kind of have to make up for that June swoon. So you might look at it and say, well, wait a minute, I'm up three people. Um, but yeah, but if you lose your 10%, like we're, uh, we're saying, um, then you, you might be at net zero uh, by the end of June. So be aware of that. So you kind of have to get ahead of the game. And I'll show you a chart here a little bit later. Um, so, okay. So where do we go from here? Um, what do we do with this information? So you've um, got these, um, uh, sorry, I was going to, before I go there, I was going to do a couple of polls here. Um, Rick, can we do poll number one? Do I need to stop sharing? Let me check here, uh, Jeff. Okay. I think we can, yep. My club's att attrition rate is, that's the one you're looking for. Yeah, that's poll number one, yeah. So, so people are leaving your club at what rate? Um, and that's on an annual basis. So am I less than 10%? I'm world-class, uh, somewhere between 10 and 15%, sort of the rotary average. It's greater than 15% or I don't know. So please enter your answer and we'll just get a sense of where everyone's at. I got 75%, uh, 80% of the people have. Uh, okay. So I'll okay. just end the poll. Okay. And there's what it looks like. Okay. So I assume um, everybody can see that. Well, I can see it for sure. Uh, hopefully everyone can. So what we said was about 32% uh, believe their attrition rates less than 10%, 43% are in that 10 to 15% range and greater than 15%, uh, well, uh, 4%. And then don't know um, is 21%. So for, if you don't know, and that's not uh, anyone's uh, failing of any kind, uh, but what that indicates is uh, Let's have some transparency uh, of the worksheets that I sent out uh, to the presidents and the membership chairs at the beginning of the year, uh, just so that everyone's aware of what their statistics are for their club, because it's hard to overcome a statistic if we don't know what they are. And follow up to this is if we can do the second poll. Okay, so my club's net attraction rate is, so it's greater than our attrition rate, um, same as our attrition rate or less than our attrition rate. So we're, we're gaining, we're staying about level uh, or we're kind of falling behind or I'm not sure. So which one? How are we doing? We're at uh, seventy-eight percent. I usually ended at eighty, but uh... okay. going once, going twice. Okay. So, for the most part, we're seeing um, groups that are kind of either staying level, <clears throat> or we're falling a little bit behind. And, um, and those that are uh, bringing in people greater than their attrition rate, that's, that's great. Um, and, uh, and of course, if we're not sure, again, we'll go back to our leadership and, and try to um, revive that worksheet um, that details uh, your specific club. Okay, thank you. All 
right, so where do we go from here? So we know there was a survey in zones 28 and 32 on um, about 90 clubs that have grown over the last five years, including during the pandemic. Uh, they've grown about five plus members and there's certain attributes. And, and if you've been to the, uh, the webinar on this, I apologize for the repeated information, but uh, an old boss of mine used to say that in order for people to kind of really uh, have information sink in, you got to hear it five times. And hopefully I'll talk about it in a slightly different way that, that is helpful. Okay, for sure. And so uh, strong leadership, clear membership goals and the growth plan, I'll go into these more detail active in the community, many events and service projects, visibility in the community with a strong public image and active and intentional member engagement. Okay, so we'll talk about those in more detail. Here we go. So what is strong leadership? What does it look like? Uh, well, it's a servant leadership uh, style. Um, and I'll show you some examples here in a bit. Um, they understand both the member and the community needs, and it's not dependent on just one person. Uh, so this is uh, your leadership group, and, uh, and really what we should be looking for uh, is, is continuity. Uh, so we don't see uh, a situation where uh, we have uh, one uh, president come in, and all of a sudden, we're, we've, we've hit meteoric levels, and they move on, and the, the plan moved on with them. And then the next leader comes in, and we start to see the, the old familiar decline again. So it's, it's all about continuity, uh, working together, uh, developing a long-term plan, not just uh, let's get this done this year. And we won't worry about what we have to do next year. So, and it's a commitment to that plan over the long term. So, it, I'm sorry, on my screen, my thing is uh, is in the way. I got to move it out of the way here because I can't read that. <clears throat> okay. Attracting new members. So we do need to start with a goal and a growth plan, which is what I was talking about. And again, it should be a longer term plan. Um, and you know at least a three-year plan um, where you're going to take on specific actions and what we know about all of these successful and agile clubs is that um, they're very active and uh, they're not passive about uh, membership and and they take very forward actions uh, and and that's part of their plan and so they're executing the plan they develop the plan they execute the plan and, and everyone's bought into it and they move forward with it. So we do need to know what problem we're trying to solve. Are we trying to solve the excessive attrition problem? Are we trying to solve the insufficient attraction problem? Or are we trying to solve both? And when we look at our uh, worksheets, um, we'll know um, that uh, it, it kind of spells it out for us. So we know we either have excessive attrition, insufficient attraction, or we're dealing with both issues as a club. And here's some examples of what these sheets look like. So I think somebody had asked me, what do these things look like? Um, so I cut off uh, the club names just for their uh, privacy sake, but, uh, but these are what they, they look like. So. You've got a club here with a 23% attrition rate, uh, a 17% attraction rate, which is a good attraction rate, really, if it wasn't for the fact that the attrition was so high. Um, here you have kind of this phenomenon I was talking about where you've got a club growing and you get into a, a presidential year where we've done great things. And then we kind of get into our familiar um, uh, decline and uh, we, we know where that goes. So in this case, you've got a balance almost between these two things over the five-year period, but you can see graphically where the problem is. Right? 
And then here you've got kind of slow, steady growth. And, um, and that's what you want to see. The only issue with this is, you know, reasonably high attrition, not out of the norm. Uh, it is less than 15%, but a good, strong attraction rate and a good overall uh, uh, growth rate. So what we look at is what is your starting membership at the start of the rotary year? Um, what uh, sort of membership goal? So if I could close my eyes and look at our club in July 1st of next year, what, not, what number would I put in there? Then I look at what net membership growth is that? Well, that's simply uh, subtracting one from the other, that's five. But what is my average annual attrition that I need to replace people? And that's four. That means I need a plan down here overall to find nine people. And the nine people are, is what you need to focus in on. I need to find nine people. If I'm over here and I'm losing people, I really need to figure out both, keep my, uh, my attraction rate up, but drop my attrition rate down. So really it's, uh, it's a, a, a low retention issue that we need to figure out. And again, use the five whys um, as much as you can, get down to the actual reason people are leaving. People uh, leave their Rotary clubs. They don't leave Rotary. They leave the people there. Maybe they weren't welcome. Maybe there weren't enough projects for them. Maybe there were too many projects for them. Uh, maybe they weren't connected to their community. Uh, maybe uh, their emotional return on investment wasn't there. So we have to really do some digging to get to these numbers. Right? Here's another comment. Um, yeah, so Margie said, if only each member could recruit one member, it is simple, but it, obviously it's difficult, yes. Um, but I would posit this, and uh, when I was up in Innisfail talking to the club there, uh, we, we talked about that, and I said, well, so if you stay to the club, if everybody could just bring in one member, that would be great, that would solve our problem. And if we haven't assigned that to somebody specifically and given them a buy date, um, then that basically absolves everybody of finding someone, right? But if you say, Margie, at our next meeting, can I ask you to bring somebody to the next meeting? Would you invite someone to join you? I think that's a more powerful thing. And then, then specifically, I've, I've asked you, um, so if I'm your club president and I've asked you to bring somebody, you're probably going to buy into that much more than if I just said, hey, everybody, if you could bring uh, an extra person in, that would be nice, right? Does that help, Margie? I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> She's typing away. Maybe, okay. So yeah, find out why people stay. Absolutely, we need to know that. And um, so people vote with their feet, right? They leave Rotary. Uh, typically it's when we get to a bit of a financial uh, pinch point at the end of the Rotary year. Um, and people go, yeah, if I do the balancing, am I gonna pay yet another uh, year's dues or am I going to skip out and go do something else that fulfills me more, right? So we do need to get to that long before June. We need to be dealing with that uh, today. Okay. So um, I don't know if any of you know Doug Griffiths. He's a uh, former um, MLA, former cabinet minister in the Alberta government. He wrote a book called 13 Ways to Kill Your Community. And uh, this fellow on the other screen here, Michelangelo Caruso, he's a uh, Rotarian from Troy, Michigan. Uh, he's also in zone 28, our shared zone. Um, he's um, a past district governor and a past uh, uh, president of his club. And so uh, he heard Doug Griffiths speak and decided that he was going to create his own video on 13 ways to kill your Rotary Club. Obviously, we don't want to kill your Rotary Club. This is sort of, uh, if you do these things, it's, it's going to be detrimental. So do the opposite is really what this is. It's kind of a reverse psychology. So I hope you enjoy it. It's just a short video here for about five minutes. Hey, it's Michelangelo Caruso. I teach presentation skills, but I'm also a lifetime Rotarian. 
We have started a Facebook group called Get the Word Out Rotary. There's also a Rotary playlist in my YouTube channel. Subscribe to be notified of new videos. I recently attended a district conference and heard some great speakers, as usual. This time I heard a speaker named Doug Griffiths, who is the author of a book, 13 Ways to Kill Your Community. I was so inspired, I've created 13 Ways to Kill Your Rotary Club. This is the short version. The first way to kill your Rotary Club is to neglect the food. Look, for centuries, people have gathered around food and drink to establish relationships, to uh, create projects, and just in, in general, just to keep up uh, appearances. Food and the accompanying ceremony is an asset to your Rotary Club, not a liability. The second way to kill your Rotary Club is to not attract businesses. Local businesses can help you identify the movers and shakers in your community. These people often make the best Rotarians. Work hard to be appealing when it comes to the length of your meeting, the time and day of your meeting, and also the location of your meeting. If you're not attracting business people, you are missing out. The third way to kill your community and your Rotary Club is to not engage the youth. Focus on the young people in your community. Why? Because parents join Rotary and kids grow up to be Rotarians. Catering to youth is one of Rotary's five areas of service. And besides, giving back to youth just makes sense. The fourth way to kill your Rotary Club is to remain convinced that you don't have to sell Rotary. The world is a busy place, ladies and gentlemen. People make decisions based on all types of value propositions. Make sure your club's value prop is undeniable. And here's a hint. Your goal is not to get all of your Rotarians to agree on the value proposition. Your goal is to cultivate a value proposition that resonates with tons of people. The fifth way to grow your Rotary Club is to, or to kill your Rotary Club, is to let other service clubs do the heavy lifting. I'll bet that there's an, uh, a neighboring club that has a lock on your community, right? That's your perception anyway. Well, this should encourage your Rotary Club, not discourage it. Remember, Walgreens always builds next to Rite Aid. Home Depot always builds next to Lowe's. Competition is good for your club. Take advantage of it. The sixth way to kill your Rotary Club is to not worry about first impressions. Every successful business enterprise worries about something called curb appeal, a fresh coat of paint, competitive analysis. Constantly monitor what first-time visitors think when they come to your club. Look for patterns and address the weak spots. The seventh way to kill your club is to not work with other area organizations. Some groups in your area have no doubt figured it out. Monitor the local chamber of commerce, other social groups, and other service clubs. Hitch your wagon to groups with bigger wagons and everyone will be the better for it. Engage in cross promotions and host joint events. The eighth way to kill your Rotary Club is to live in the past. Yeah, keep touting your uh, achievements from five years ago as current events and work hard at self-aggrandizement so that you become delusional about what's really happening to your formerly great Rotary Club. The ninth way to kill your Rotary Club is to shut out your seniors. Remember, a good Rotary Club is a mirror of the people in its community. Seniors have money and most of them have time. They all have something called institutional memory, a real asset to your Rotary Club. The tenth way to kill your club is to reject new stuff. Yeah, that Facebook thing will never last. Push back against change. Resist technology. Just because uh, you, if, you, uh, if you stop trying new things, you will get exactly what you deserve, a stale and antiquated Rotary Club. The eleventh way to kill your club is to ignore outsiders. Keep discounting visitors' opinions because they don't understand us. Be comfortable with the fact that your Rotary Club is friendly but not welcoming and you can be comfortable in that fact because that's what the visitors are telling you. The twelfth way to kill your club is to grow complacent. Remember, apathy is the beginning of the end of your club. And the thirteenth way to kill your Rotary Club is to keep thinking that someone else will make the changes that need to happen. 
Don't take responsibility and your club will tank faster than it otherwise might. Do not count on next year's president. This is your job. Let's get it done. You can get more great strategies for marketing your Rotary Club on the Get the Word Out Rotary Facebook group. And of course, you can also check out my YouTube channel, which features a playlist on Rotary. Thanks for all you do for the greatest service organization in the world. So hopefully that uh, was a good video for you. Uh, I got a comment there, that's great. Um, and I like uh, Michelangelo Caruso. So if you don't uh, follow him on YouTube, uh, definitely he's worth subscribing to. He's got lots of great information. And uh, it was because of one of his uh, video uh, blogs that uh, we found uh, a person in Ontario that uh, does uh, rotary website redesigns. And I was talking about the ugly baby earlier on and our website was definitely the ugly baby. And, uh, and so definitely uh, check it out. He's got lots of great information. Thanks everyone. Let's try to get to the next one. So <clears throat> clear goals and a plan. Uh, so when we look at these uh, 90 clubs, the um, attrition and member engagement obviously was uh, low attrition and high engagement. 85% um, uh, had a club membership committee. Uh, within our district, um, 28 out of 46 clubs um, have a membership chair and the others do not. So if you don't have a membership chair, let alone a committee, please do um, have somebody be the prime person for that. Because when I send out uh, information to membership chairs via Club Runner, I click off membership chairs and it sends the blast out to all of them. Uh, so if you don't have somebody catching that information, then you're missing out. 83% um, of them uploaded their membership goals into the Rotary Club Central. And I'm hoping everybody does that in our district. Um, but uh, if you haven't, please do. Uh, so go back to those worksheets that I gave you. Um, and if you didn't get your worksheet, you can email me afterwards. I'll put my email address in the chat and I'll resend it to you. There's nothing secret in that information. It's just simply the facts and data. And uh, I don't want to be the Debbie Downer, but I just think you need to know where you're at in order to know where you're going to go. So get your goals into Rotary Club Central. And active attraction by members was a key strategy. Um, I know, Dan, you're pretty passionate about this one. Did you want to touch base on that point? I know we didn't rehearse this, but we didn't, we didn't rehearse that. No, not at all. No, I mean, I, I am passionate. I mean, it's like it's like in business. If you've got a goal or you've got something that's being measured and you've got a team working on it, it'll happen. If if you just kind of wander in the woods and and uh, just allow one person a membership uh, chair to, to run your your program, it, it's not going to work. My my line is that uh, membership is a contact sport, and that really means that uh, we all have a role uh, in bringing that together. So, yeah, I, this is this is an incredibly important part of it. So of what we're doing, I was just about to go look and see how many people had uploaded their goals. I, I, I've got that ability, but uh, uh, that's when you caught me. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Dan. No, I appreciate that. Mm. Okay. So active in their community. So what does that look like? Uh, so they have um, many highly visible service projects. They have many events and service projects, often monthly or ongoing, and 67% held events targeted at new member attraction. So when I took a scan around our, our district, we've got a lot of clubs doing a lot of things. And some of you are very good at being on social media. Some of you are not on social media. Um, so, um, but being active in your local community, um, when I subscribe to your Facebook page, it's not because I'm being nosy, it's just because I'm trying to get a sense of where all the clubs are in our district. And, uh, and certainly I cheer you on uh, when, you're, when you're doing some great things out there. But, uh, but please uh, do adopt social media, be active in your local community. Um, and like I say, many of you are, 
and uh, and then be visible, and um, and you got to spread the word. So when we talk about that, we talk about um, visibility and a strong public image. Uh, so I just kind of pulled a couple of things here. Uh, so we've got a web page of one of the clubs here. Um, one of the things that uh, I mentioned that we had um, a young lady come and fix up our ugly baby uh, website. Uh, one of the things she added in the um, the banner line here is uh, a join us button. So like there is on on the um, RI website, there's a join rotary button, but why not have one at the club level so that you get a message that somebody wants to join your club. And since we've done that, we've had two people that have clicked on that button and we got messages, right? Uh, I love this uh, here from uh, Innisfail. They uh, were out at, uh, at Westerner Park uh, with a, uh, a junior hockey game, uh, very visible in their, uh, in their uh, rotary yellow. Uh, and on their Facebook page, they've got a button set up here to send them a message. So, hey, I, I, I'd like to be part of that. I'd like to you know, be part of that service uh, uh, club as well. So it gives people an easy way into your club uh, you've got good pictures here. They're nice and bright and lots of good colors. And you see uh, people of all ages uh, out there participating. And that's the kind of image that you want to portray. I believe, um, um, was it Robin Braley uh, was uh, last month's uh, seminar. So he had lots of good information as well. If you're looking for information on how to share information on Facebook or Instagram, uh, you know, certainly... I'm sure he doesn't mind uh, being approached and, and I don't mind either. I'm, I do that for my club as well. Um, active and intentional member engagement. So uh, consistent meetings with, with mixed formats, uh, friendly, fun, and inclusive. Um, new member onboarding. Um, I, I hope most clubs do this well. Um, and uh, we borrowed a checklist from uh, my club from the Heritage Park Club. And they got a nice little checklist for new member onboarding. So we match up our new member uh, as a mentee to a mentor, and they go through a checklist over a period of time. And uh, so things like uh, attend a board meeting or uh, act as a greeter. Uh, so I know that some of the clubs have different ways of doing this, but it certainly does engage them uh, when they come on board and they don't feel like, oh, uh, why did I join? Um, engaged in communities and projects, and the contributions are regularly recognized. I see there's a question in chat. Uh, it says, Margie says, I think it's critical to ask new members what they think their club could do or needs to do in the community to meet a need. Yeah, so for sure, understand what your community needs and who better than the people that are just joining your club. And so I've got another brief video here. I'm not going to do the whole thing, uh, but what you see here in this picture is uh, this gentleman's a guest of Rotary, and they've got him coloring in a coloring book. And I'll explain that in just a minute, but I'll, I'll make sure that you all get the link to this. Um, it's about 40 some minutes long, which we don't have, but I, I thought there's some really interesting ideas about Guilford Rotary Secret Sauce for Growth. Welcome everybody. My name is Ron Pierce. I am the past president for the Guilford Rotary Club. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is membership and membership growth strategies. And what we did as a club to kind of change things uh, up in our club and to make things better and to help encourage growth. I want to give you a little background information about what we are as a club and about our size. So. Uh, when you look at these numbers, you're going to notice that we're a pretty decent sized club you know, and we grew until about 2016 and then something started happening and I don't know if you've ever experienced this as a club, but all of a sudden people just start disappearing. I'm going to move ahead a little bit to his analysis. That plus one, just, just plus one, you know, is what we decided as a club. president. So the next thing we had to do was talk about the problem to solve. PTS. Now I heard a speaker at an international convention in Toronto and he talked about this and he said, you know, a lot of people, 
when they're trying to figure out what's wrong with something, they try to fix the symptom and not the problem. Well, thinking about that, our declining membership was truly just a symptom. It wasn't our problem. So what was our problem? Well, our problem was we had lost our passion and purpose in being Rotarians. I mean, think about it. There are people who've got passion all the time to go play golf every weekend. Okay, you're not going to get them away from the golf course. It doesn't matter what comes up. They're going to. I'm going to move forward a bit here again. Want to get to participate. So whatever we did, it had to be something they could do as well. More service projects. Okay? So, what is an example of this? We did coloring books for kids at Moses Cone. Now, how did this work? I went and got coloring books and crayons and Ziploc gallon size Ziploc bags. I had everybody get a coloring book, everybody got a pack of crayons, rip out a sheet out of the coloring book and I want you to color it. You have not seen anything until you have seen an original 75, 80 years old sitting there coloring a coloring page and they were laughing and having a great time doing it. Then I told them sign it, put your name and then put your age and they just kind of looked at me like I had lost my mind. We put the coloring book and the crayons in the Ziploc bag. We put that picture they had just colored right in front of it, a little sticker that said this came from Rotary, sealed it up, put them in a box, and I took them over to the hospital. We distributed or let the hospital distribute them out to the kids uh, who were sick, but the parents were the ones who really got what had happened because they saw those pictures that said Larry, age 80, had colored this, and they chuckled. And if you've ever had a sick kid and been in the hospital, you know that laughter is something that's very hard to come by. So not only do we brighten the kid's day, we brighten the parent's day as well. This was getting everybody involved in Rotary and everybody could participate because there's some of my originals there and they're coloring and they're having a great time doing it. Okay? And take a look there. We had a guest come. What a great way to introduce somebody to Rotary. Look, we're doing a project for the community and we're doing it right here while you're with us. So I won't carry on uh, with that, but I will send you the link afterwards because it's a long video. Uh, but ultimately their goal was to be plus 11 by the end of the rotary year. And, um, and that's the net number he was looking for. So after that year, um, he refers to his older members as the originals. Um, and, um, and so they lost no one and they gained 11 new members over the course of the year and simply by engaging everyone and doing simple things. There are several other examples here. It's a good video. So certainly I'll send it out so that everyone has that information along with what uh, Rick is going to send afterwards. Okay. So that's, you don't have to go any that's one club's approach. And there's another approach here. So the Guild for example is an example of how you can incrementally grow your club. Um, impact clubs are something how you can transformationally grow your club. And so what is an impact club? An impact club is a service only club. They don't have meetings. They typically are a younger demographic and they're attached to your club. Um, they are in rotary uh, parlance, they're a satellite club. Uh, but they are uh, specifically looking at service projects only, micro service projects. Uh, they could be meeting virtually every day of the month um, doing their projects. And, and that's what they do. They just simply are service only type clubs. They're a member of your club and, um, and uh, they need the, obviously the love and support of the main club. Um, but uh, they they kind of do their thing, and uh, as and they're they're called companion clubs in this terminology as opposed to satellite clubs because I think when we think about a satellite club, the hope is at some point they get enough members and they can charter their own Rotary club. And this uh, an, um, analogy or this type of a club, we're looking uh, at them as a, a long term relationship between the impact club and the main club. And uh, so it's not, um, uh, you know, we're gonna lose all these people once they spin off into their own club. Um, that's not the intent here. The intent is they are a going concern that stays with you, is attached to your club, 
And you can have members kind of moving back and forth. If you could potentially have some of your members in your main club move over into this um, impact club for various reasons. Uh, they want the service only aspect. They don't really want to have meetings um, or maybe some of the lower costs uh, that are associated with it because there's no meals. Um, it's something that uh, we just recently uh, had a presentation on. Okay, so, um, so that's the end of the presentation part. I promised to give some time for Q&A. Um, I know we've been kind of chatting as we've gone through, and I realize I've just sort of sprung on you this impact club thing, but it's sort of an example. In the first example with the Guildford Rotary is how you can incrementally grow your club. And with impact clubs, if you can find eight or 10 or 15 people that want to do um, service and it's along the lines of something specific, maybe it's um, ecology, uh, or maybe it's uh, stamping out domestic violence. Uh, this club is kind of focused on that, but they're part of your club. Okay. And so I'm going to go to the next slide, which is... Um, where we are right now. So I want to give you some hope before we leave today. So this is, I got this information just today. This is a thing called success track. So if we look at the yellow line, this is our district's historic average. So we start off with zero. So it's whatever our head count is for members at the start of the Rotary year on July 1. And then we work through this uh, scenario, you get to Christmas time, the January billing and we drop off a bunch of people and then we grow rotary for the rest of the the spring and into June and then we hit the what I called earlier the June swoon where we drop off a whole pile of people. The green line is our target and our target is can we be up a half of a percent by the end of the year and so if we are tracking to this green line we and, and it sort of follows the yellow, but at a little higher altitude. Um, and we uh, see that when we finally get that final drop off, we're still a half a percent to the good. So far this year, the blue line is our, where we're tracking in our district. And, and I'm happy with that. We're at 40 new people by the end of October, net new and, um, and, and climbing. If we keep uh, this track, because uh, we think it'll go along the same lines as this, we're going to be up maybe uh, 54 people by the end of the year, which I think is phenomenal. It starts to put an end to that downward spiral. And, uh, and I hope that we all take some solace from that. Whatever you're doing to grow Rotary in your clubs, you're doing the right thing. If you haven't been contributing yet to this 40 number, then there's still time, let's get that done, okay? And so we have a finish line, it's, it is June 30th. Um, so let's keep it going strong, let's finish strong. And do we have any questions? Hit the Q&A at the bottom of your screen uh, to enter a question and then we can see it. Yeah, Jeff, there's been no show up till now, but I would say if you wanna stop, uh sharing um we can ask people to put if they have any immediate burning questions or just unmute themselves raise their hand unmute themselves and ask the question but maybe to start with um your impact club or satellite club um so, maybe, maybe yourself or dan could or i know martin parnell's on here tonight maybe Martin could talk about the Cochrane, Cochrane, Rocky Mountain uh, example. Are they able to unmute themselves? I didn't know they, they could. Should, they should be able to. But maybe put something in the chat box or Q&A box. Yeah, maybe the best thing. They should be able to, though. Yeah. So... Oh, there we go. They can't unmute. So why don't why don't I I can I can answer a little bit of that uh, Rocky Mountain Club. I mean, it started pre-pandemic um, where uh, they had a real passionate uh, group of young professionals living in the community, 
and um, they were brought on as a satellite club, uh, which really means, you know, they, they belong to your club, but they have the, their own structure. But all, all that heavy lifting on all the, you know, doing all the dues and, and the reporting and all that kind of stuff is really handled by the, the, uh, the club, uh, the master club. And, and it allows the younger members they, to create their own kind of do structure and, and focus and where they wanted to go. And uh, I think Martin would agree. I mean, originally, right out of, right out of the shoot um, uh, of COVID, they, they responded real quickly and did a couple of things, uh, did some outdoor uh, um, movies, uh, like old drive-in movies that they were able to put on and raise uh, funds for the, the food bank and do a whole bunch of things. So really got engaged. And, and, and the, the real risk here and the real thing that, you know, uh, Martin and I have talked about and, and others in leadership is when you have a satellite club, you got to make sure that the, there's continuity in your leadership in your master club or the, the club that's sponsoring them. Because, you know, you go from a, a, a president that's totally engaged with them and understands and wants them to drive their own agenda. Then you got another one. The next one comes in. Oh, yeah, we'll support them. Then the third one comes in and says, well, how come they're not paying the full dues? And, you know, we're doing all the work. So and that really, they're really. And then also their focus through through COVID, it kind of wavered a little bit. And uh, there was really a dialogue uh, just before they they chartered. They really had a soul search about how how do we, you know, what do we want to be? Do we want to even be a Rotary Club, right? What, what's the benefit of being in Rotary? And, uh, or do we want to just go off and do community service work? So there was great dialogue and Martin and the team stepped up and we, you know, we had a lot of great dialogue with them and, and they really did want to become rotor members because of all the advantages. But having a satellite club isn't a passive thing. I mean, again, I'm coming back to my line. It's a membership is a contact sport. And that means you've got to be in touch and, and passionate and engaged and, and be there to support them. So yeah, Martin, uh, Martin has his hand up and I'm going to allow him to talk. So uh, Martin, take it away. Yeah, hi, can you uh, hear me, uh, guys? Yes. yes. Great. Well, I just want to yeah, just reflect on what Dan said. And I, you know, I totally agree. It's um, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of uh, communication, especially with the main club. And Dan pointed out the change in leadership. And one of your five attributes is a strong leadership. And I think we've there's a lot to learn from what we went through with Cochrane about having representation on the board and keeping those lines of communication open because there was there was a couple of rocky spots along the way where we weren't sure where it was going. They pulled it back. We're now it's now a fully fledged uh, Rotary Club, and they're doing some amazing uh, fundraising. But it's not passive. Exactly what Dan's saying. You've got to stay on top of it. There's got to be members who are committed to it and to work through it. But I'm also interested, Dan, in what in um, Jeff and what you're saying about the Impact Clubs. Uh, also, Sue and I are talking about, Sue's on the membership committee now, the district membership committee, talking about new clubs, core space clubs, a lot of opportunities. I think, um, yeah, it's a pretty exciting time. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. I, I, before we close, I want to make sure we get the, to the questions online. Thank you, Martin. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, so on, online, uh, Ray, Raymond Rogers asks, uh, do we track non-paying honorary Rotarians? Um, not in that number that we're showing um, the 40 additionals, uh, so they, they don't show up in that rate. Um, Jeff, uh, uh, Vice, Vice. Vice Sanford has her hand up, so I'll now allow her to talk. Okay. Hi. Hello, Vi. Hi, I just um, typed my question into the Q&A box, but essentially the question I have is, is it advisable to subsidize people who are new members to encourage diversity, equity, and inclusion? So I, I think that becomes a, a question that each club has to answer themselves. I mean, so our RI isn't going to give you a break on the dues, and, and I, you know, unless they're under 40, you're not going to see a break on the district level. Uh, the club level dues, you have full um, ability to do what you need to do at the club level. 
And, um, and if you wish to further subsidize, it becomes a club decision. Um, the, the, you kind of also get into that balance where if something is given for nothing or less than it's worth, then does it have perceived value by the person receiving it? So you got to have a balance in there somewhere. Um, we've done that uh, for uh, a young mom that joined our club and um, a few Rotarians pitched in to pay her dues for a couple of uh, cycles. And then when it came time for her to start paying, um, she left like uh, as, as quick as, as she came. Um, so I, I think it becomes a, a question of value and how long do you want to sustain that for? And, you know, it, it's a great idea, uh, but I think you have to kind of test the waters a little bit. But. Yeah, well, I think it's really important that you're there to support the members. And it's not always new members. And very often, and especially during COVID, uh, I've seen a number of cases right across the zone uh, where clubs have, have uh, worked hard to support each other's dues and membership to keep their members in, uh, whether there's employment issues or other other things happening. So, you know, again, it is a club thing. It's your values and how you how you perceive it. But it's also really important that when you do this or we make a decision, it's not just a board decision. It's one that you should have a discussion if you're going to create a new membership uh, category. Uh, it, it, that, that everybody understands it so that some of the older members aren't, uh, their noses aren't out of, out of joint. I see, I see Margie's got a, a question about what's happening across the zone 28 and 32. And uh, I, I can tell you that last year zone 28, we didn't fare <laughs> uh, across, uh, across the zones. And, and, and primarily we had a, more lo losers than, than gains uh, in zone 32 uh, they were winners. They they actually uh, last year, I think, because they opened up earlier across the border. They were primarily most of Zone 32 is, and they had live meetings sooner than we have had up here, and we're we're back more engaged. But they had a very positive. We are seeing this year uh, Zone 28 is uh, we're starting to move forward, as Jeff said. Uh, I'm I'm kind of accountable for uh, four different districts. And uh, three of the four are uh, in a bit of a growth mode. Um, one is still quite having some some concerns. Uh, but, you know, I'll, I'll go back to what Jeff had, uh, that chart that shows that our, our trends. And uh, if, if we continue on the trend, we're going to be exactly where District 5550 is, which is just to the east of us, which is Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Northern Ontario. Uh, they, they're, they're down under 1,200 members, and uh, they have been given notice that they need to uh, restructure and get a, a, a membership plan in place or they will be redistricted. Uh, so that, that's a real thing that happens. I, I worked with them in developing their plan. I think they're passionate. They're going to get there. Uh, which what I really like is what Steve's leadership and some other things that uh, our district is helping them as well. And we're trying to do some things together. So th this is, this is right across North America, what we're talking about here. So. Thanks. Um, Thanks Dan. Yeah. Do you have a, uh, want to make some final words? Cause we're at the, uh, yeah. we're at the hour. Yeah. I realize uh, before we close, I'm going to put a pitch in for the district membership committee. Um, so I want to thank uh, Janice Wing out of Innisfail and Sue Carpenter Parnell out of Cochrane, who have joined the, the uh, district uh, membership committee. And uh, I'm, I'm also going to be approaching or have approached the uh, UFC Rotaract Club to get some younger perspectives on there. And uh, so uh, we're hoping to grow it, but uh, get get a hold of me if uh, it's Jeff, Do uh, sorry, Jeff Foss, J-E-F-F-F-O-S-S -S at telusplanet.net and uh, we'll make sure you have that in the mail out afterwards as well and thanks, thank Jeff. you everyone thank you thanks thank uh, you. for a great presentation thanks dan for joining us and to martin and vi for uh, raising their hands and and, and having some interesting uh, comments um so um thanks to i think the 38 i counted people that joined us this evening so that's pretty good 
Uh, look for a PDF of Jeff's PowerPoint slide presentation in your email inbox tomorrow. And if Jeff sends me the link for that video that he talked about, I'll include that at the same time. Our next webinar is scheduled for Wednesday, December the 14th. Uh, it's going to be presented by our Indigenous Relations Committee, led by Cam Stewart. Uh, so I hope uh, reg registration will probably open up uh, by the end of the week. So I want to thank everybody again for attending and participating in this club learning webinar. Good evening and um, have the rest of a great week. Bye for now. Bye now.